Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Bob. Um, because some of you just had that pizza and you had to listen to Bob introduce me, I think I'm going to start the evening with this and see if this gets us off onto the right foot here. Good, right? Any day you get to hear that is a good day, right? That's just a great song. We all, we all love it. It was great to have it as an opening number on the Grammys. Um, some of you I have met before, some of you I, I haven't, most of you I haven't. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit about what I do on the Grammys, and a lot about uh, the Grammys. I started in Chicago, I still live in Chicago, I still live here, um, in the recording studios. I'm a recording engineer by training, I'm a, a, a mixer, I design studios, I built and managed studios, Chicago Recording Company I'm still associated with. We have a studio in Burbank, California, so I'm still very much involved in that side of the work. Um, Today, just as an aside, I really spend most of my time in music television. I produce, prim most of my work is I produce live webcasts and stream them from music festivals like Coachella and Lollapalooza and Bonnaroo. So I'm kind of off into that world today and dealing with all the vidiots, but there's still some audio involved. So we, we, we keep, uh, there's still some sound. Um, I've been involved in the Grammy telecast for more than 25 years. I think I started around 1990. It could have been 1989. And I carry a title that we use to describe what I do is I'm the, I supervise the broadcast audio. Now, most TV shows don't have anything like that layer, but the Recording Academy takes sound a little bit more seriously than most television shows. So the Recording Academy has myself uh, and uh, my late colleague uh, that many of you knew, Murray Allen did a, was part of my team on that, the late Phil Ramone, the legendary producer who was here just a few years ago on this stage and gave a great presentation here at Sure, uh, was also uh, with us supervising the broadcast audio. We take it very seriously, we enjoy it, we try and aim higher than most shows uh, do, and I'm going to describe to you some of the ways that we do that, try and uh, show you that. Um, I remember a lot of it, but I don't remember all of it, so if I get some dates wrong, you'll let me know. Um, Please don't hesitate to ans ask me any questions along the way during the show or during the presentation or after is fine. Um, I know a lot about the Grammy show, but there's m so much more that I don't know that I hope you'll bear with me and we'll get through this. Now, I've been around the Grammys for a real long time, not just the television show. At one point, I was the chairman of the board of trustees. I've been the chairman of the board of the Music Cares Foundation. Um, I've been the Chicago chapter president for the Grammys. And uh, I want to tell you how much I actually like the Grammys. And the reason I like it so much is it's a peer organization. So the people that are members of the Grammys, and many, many of you I hope are or have been and, and should be if you're not, it's a peer organization of record makers. So when people are involved in this, you're talking to other producers, engineers, singers, uh, uh, musicians, uh, producers. And um, when people vote for these awards, there are other people voting that have been through the trials and tribulations of trying to make a good record. And if any of you in your audio careers have spent time in the studios, you know how daunting that is and how we all aim to make really good records and how challenging it is. Um, I'm going to come back later in the program and talk about a little bit about the winner of Album of the Year this year, Beck, but the thing I want to mention to you now is that album didn't just win Album of the Year, it won Best Engineered Recording as well. And that ha doesn't happen most years in the Grammys that the Album of the Year wins but also Best Engineered. It happened last year with the Daft Punk record, an unbelievably good sounding record. This Beck album is also an unbelievably great sounding record and achievement by those mixers. So that always makes me feel better when the Album of the Year also has been recognized for great sound. Um, at the Grammy show, I mentioned we take the sound very seriously. Um, we do it for the artists. Uh, this is their biggest audience on television. Uh, we want them to shine. 
uh, one of the, the, the producers for many years, he died at a relatively young age just about two years ago, John Cassette. Uh, just a few years ago, I, we were having some issue with, with sound and we needed some support from production. And I went over to him and told him our problem and he just turned to me and he said, it's the Grammys, it's about the sound. And I just never ever expected to hear that from the producer of the show. And uh, it, it, we love him for that and we miss him for that. And uh, that's one of the things that distinguishes uh, the Grammy telecast. Um, how many of you actually saw the show two weeks ago? A good amount. I'd say more than half. Okay, good. Some of you waved kind of like this, so I don't know how much you liked it. I can't really tell. Okay. Um, let's talk about the audio, though, which is the part that I really know and that I'm involved with. Um, it is literally the most complex audio production in television broadcasting. Now, if you stop to think of it, it's kind of obvious why in three and a half hours, it's a long show, three and a half hours, this year there was more than 20 performances. There were actually 23 performances, all multi-track, all live, all have to be balanced in real time. We balance approaching about a thousand inputs have to be out balanced in the three and a half hour show. So it's a lot. We also do it off of four different performance areas now in the theater. And I actually, my, my desktop is a mess, I'm sure like all of yours. Let me show you what I mean by performance areas. Bear with me just one second. Okay, I'm just going to show you some of the band plots to get you into some of what's involved in the Grammys. So here's the opening number you just saw, ACDC, which is taking the whole width of the stage. We have four performance areas now in the uh, Staples Center where we do the show now. When I joined the show, we were doing it at, everybody can hear me, right? You okay? Uh, we were doing it at the Shrine Auditorium in LA, a theater that held 3,000 people. We would occasionally do it in New York at Radio City Music Hall, holds 4,500 people. And then eventually uh, they really reached up and tried to see if it worked in an arena. It did. We do it in the Staples Center now. We have done it in Madison Square Garden as well. But this is the width of the staging at the Staples Center for the ACDC number. And there are four performance areas. There's an A stage, a B stage, what they call the Passerelle, which is the walkway in front where Angus Young was soloing a minute ago. And there's a dish out in the audience for the fourth stage. This number was the whole width of the stage. So right after this, and you can see, hang on, they gave me a pointer. You can see down in this area, it says full stage. So when I go to the next page for the next number, Ariana Grande, she's over in the A stage uh, behind, behind this uh, for her number was being set up. While her number's being set up on stage A, the next number that followed that was Tom Jones and Jesse J <coughs> out on the dish. While they're setting up out on the dish, they're getting the B stage ready for Miranda Lambert. She's performing there while they're resetting the dish for Kanye and while they're resetting the whole width for Madonna, followed by resetting out on the passerelle for Ed Sheeran when they then jump back to stage A for ELO, stage B for Adam Levine and Gwen Stefani, stage A for Annie Lennox. You can see how quick this goes by, and I think we're into just maybe the first hour. Um, that's one of the real, uh, the clock keeps ticking, and I'll give you a little insight as to how we in the audio department prepare for this, but all the departments are dealing with this. Not just the artists, but uh, the, the lighting department, the scenery, band carts are moving frantically. Guys are patching in changes between the stages so that we're getting the A stage malt when we need it and the B stage malt when we need it. And of course, not only the broadcast audio, it's a typical broadcast split. The audio from the stage is going to front of house, where my department has a supervisor, Leslie Ann Jones, legendary recording engineer from Skywalker Sound, uh, supervises the house sound, which is really great. And then we also split to monitors, and of course these artists depend on their monitors, and they're all on in-ears, virtually all of them, and that's moving just as fast. So all of you that have done live shows know, just to set up one band here, Pharrell Williams' number with, with some orchestra, and all the people are out on the passerelle, um, 
you, you go to the United Center, or you go to the Riviera Theater or the Auditorium Theater, how many hours you would take spent setting this up, we had minutes. And so that's rehearsed as well. And I'll get back into uh, some of that and, and how that's done in a minute. It's certainly not done by me. The audio department on the Grammy telecast is nearly 15 people, A1s, A2s, wireless mic specialists, as well as the front of house mixers, as well as the monitor mixers. And remember, it's not just music. There's tons of other audio elements. There's presenters, there's hosts, there's winners, there's uh, audio flying in. There's also some Pro Tools support for various elements within the multi-track mix for some of these artists for most of these. Um, the mixers who uh, really do the work when you're at home listening to this are some gentlemen named uh, Eric Schilling and John Harris, who are brilliant, who do the music mixing, and Tom Holmes is our A1, our, our production mixer, who pulls it all together. Typically, my job in t includes being in the music trucks through all the rehearsals, and I used to actually stay there and supervise the mixes during the show. When our late friend Phil Ramone passed away, I moved to his chair, so I sit next to Tom Holmes and am monitoring the composite mix before it leaves our site and is transported to CBS. A lot of people involved in this. Uh, Mike Abbott, our audio coordinator, who's documenting where everything goes for every artist, from every microphone to all three front of house monitors and broadcast and what has to happen at Patchworld and wireless, he supervises all of that. Um, and fortunately, we've started to get good at this and uh, these folks have been awarded the Emmy for uh, best uh, uh, sound mix in a special, including last year, the 56, the year preceding this year. Hopefully we'll get it again. We've gotten a number of times in the last seven or eight years because they do a great, great job. Okay. Let me go back to the beginning and give you some history of how we started with this thing and try and take you up to the way we do it today. When I got involved in this thing around 1990, maybe 89, um, Murray Allen was already involved in the show and I was invited to go out by the uh, president of the academy because there had been some complaints about the broadcast sound and he thought that I was this hot kid from Chicago who might know something and Hank just go out and check it out and tell me why it's screwed up. And uh, I did. I went out to the shrine and stood behind a legendary sound mixer. So many of you have probably heard of him. His name is Ed Green. And Ed pretty much invented TV sound, certainly for specials and music, um, uh, the job of the A1, and he's won countless Emmys. And Ed was mixing the music on an analog desk in a tiny truck, not much bigger than a station wagon. And uh, they had three-hour show, and they were doing 18 performances, and he was flailing. One number would be over. He'd, he'd pull down all the faders, throw them up, and just by the seat of his pants, try and get this together with the greatest artists of the day. Prince for, for five minutes and going on and on and on. And I watched this, and I learned so much from Ed Green um, in that week. Um, I learned he told me the three rules of broadcast television audio. Get it on the air, get it on the air, and damn it, get it on the air. <laughs> and he did get it on the air. It didn't sound so great, though. It was an impossible job. There was no way to solve the riddle of all these inputs coming through so fast, and you had no real tools at that time in 1990, no automation, no way to store any snapshots. There was no way to, there were no tools. And so I, I kind of went home from that experience thinking, okay, they're looking to me to help this and make it better, but I got to think about this. How are we going to fix this? This is screwed up. Um, Later that winter, there was a concert on HBO, and it was the Rolling Stones Steel Wheels Tour pay-per-view. I can't remember, HBO at that time, I, I was something, I, I think it was a pay-per-view, but I, or HBO at the time in 1990. And it sounded incredible. It was the best sounding piece of music I'd ever heard on broadcast television. We were blown away. And Literally, a few weeks later, at the AES convention, um, I ran into Bob Clearmountain, who mixed 
this steel wheel show for the Rolling Stones. And I had met Bob once before, but we, we were barely acquainted, but I grabbed him and I said, you gotta help me. I got this Grammy show and it's a little screwed up. We're trying to figure out how to fix it. Your show sounded incredible. How did you do it? And he said, well, he was, he's a very humble guy in, in this regard, a modest guy. He explained to me exactly. He said, well, the Rolling Stones were doing the same show every night, and I did it for six shows before that, so I did get to rehearse it, so I understood how to do it. And then he said, well, where's your show? I said, well, this year we're moving to New York. We're going to be at Radio City this coming year. He said, I used a great truck in New York. you got to call these guys F&L Music. They have an SSL console in their truck. And SSLs were, were pretty new and very cutting edge at the time and in the studios, but I didn't know anyone that had one in a remote truck, and here was Bob Clearmont recommending this. So I called Randy Israti, I didn't know, and we got him involved, and he became our main music truck in New York that year. He mixed the show, he had a lot of techniques to, if you remember, in those days, SSL Automation took snapshots of your settings, of all your dynamic, all your processing, all your EQ, all your reverb, all your processing. Uh, it would take snapshots, so you'd have to go back, call up the snapshot, and null out each knob. Well, that wasn't practical for us at all. We still didn't have any more time. We couldn't do that. That didn't help. But Randy had these crazy techniques where he'd put colored dots around the console to remind him of stuff, and he was very good, and he helped us. But what I did that year, and that year or the year after, I realized one mixer couldn't mix the whole show. It just was impossible. So we got two trucks. So we would simply A, B. All right, so that concept of band one is in this, Aunt Randy's truck, band two would be in the next truck. In a couple years, we had Dave Hewitt's remote recording and Dave's legendary mixer in the remote field. And we tried to see if that helped us, give us more time. At least the A truck could be setting up while the B truck was mixing, and the B truck was setting up while the A truck was mixing. And it gave us a little bit of help but it still didn't work because we still didn't have enough time to get the balance of the music the way we wanted to get it before we ran out of time, either in rehearsal or on the show. So we all did it by the seat of our pants and gritted our teeth and sailed through. Um, we struggled through with this, and then digital came, thank you very much, and suddenly we had some new ideas of how we could use uh, the new tools to help our problem. And uh, a number of you, I'm sure at some point, saw Neve Capricorn consoles, which were, again, the early large format digital desks that were, were popular in some recording studios. Abbey Road put in the first one. And Randy Israti put one in his truck. He replaced his SSL with this digital desk. All right, that gave us a tremendous amount of new tools. We didn't have to worry about snapshots that we had to null out anymore. We could instantaneously change from the first band to the second band and have all the things that we had done in rehearsal um, that we had saved, reverb levels, compression levels, the basic balance, not, not no fader automation. We'd start with a bass line. The mixers still have to mix the songs because no, no console automation would be relevant to this. And beside, when you rehearse with an artist, once they get on the show, everything changes. Their, their hearts are beating faster, they're a little more anxious, there's an audience, they hit the guitar harder, they hit the snare drum harder, that changes your mix. So the mixers are very good at responding to that, but the baseline starting point that we'd hope to have in store from rehearsals, we did have in the day of the Capricorn. So that helped us for a while, for four or five years, I think four or five years. Um, this had to be, I think we put in the Neve, Randy put in the Neve in 94, 95. Um, the other thing it allowed us to do was go from two trucks back to one. Now at least the whole show, people were balancing them on the same monitors. Before when we had two trucks, we had two sets of monitors, we didn't quite know it, it sounded good in the truck, we didn't really know what we were getting out of there, but this was again becoming more professional as, as the tools uh, allowed it, allowed it. Um, it still wasn't great. And the reason it wasn't great is we didn't have enough rehearsal time. Now, you guys know how we audio people are. We just want more time. We want to rewind and do it again. We want to listen to it again. We need time. And at the Grammys, and you can see, see if I can show you something here. Showed you band plots. 
Let's look at a, at a rehearsal schedule. No, that's the show rundown, wrong one. Schedule, quickie. Let's try that. Okay. So this is actually, the, the, the show was like February 8th this year. The rehearsal, the, the schedule for production starts two weeks before, January 26th. They start loading things into the uh, Staples Center and building that huge stage and all the trusses. I have no insight into that. It takes a long time and the Lakers have to, and Clippers have to leave. Just like the Bulls leave here for the circus, they have to leave for the Grammys out of the Staples Center. But when we get to our rehearsals, rehearsals, the show's always on a Sunday, and we rehearse starting on Thursday. Let me take you to the Friday rehearsal schedule right here. You can see ACDC is on the stage for 45 minutes only, and that's a big amount of time. So Lily asks you to get a sound check, 15 minutes to tap the mics. They get to rehearse for 45 minutes. They probably ran through it two times. Three would have been lucky. So we only get to hear it twice. It's not really enough time for us. We hear it twice. How could we really get a balance on a multi-track? Some of the inputs, ACDC is a classic rock band. They had 25 inputs. But some of these bands have 60 or 70 inputs. How could we possibly get a mix just hearing the song twice? And that had been our problem since I'd gotten involved in this show. We didn't have enough time. And uh, we were always struggling with this. We can't impose on production and say we're not done. There's 23 other bands they have to rehearse. They have to keep on their schedule, and uh, they would not be happy if we were uh, uh, slowing them down. You can see after I go through here, uh, the next artist they rehearsed, Brandy Clark and Dwight Yoakam, had a half hour, 12 to 12.30. Um, Sam Smith, one hour with Mary J. Blige, Miranda Lambert, 45 minutes. And literally, that means the director's on stage for the first rundown, the producers are there, scenery, band cards are moving. They get to run through it about twice. So what were we going to do? How could we address this? Say again? Uh, there are some meal breaks in there. Hang on, I'll find your meal break. Uh, there's a, a meal break on Friday... <laughs> Meal right there, four to five. Walk away. Um, what really changed it for us was Pro Tools. We'd had digital, we had the Capricorn desk, but when Pro Tools came in, and, we kind of, and, and not just when it came in, when it got to a level where the quality and reliability was something we could depend on, where the preamps were, were good enough. In fact, uh, at this show, uh, we use Grace preamps, uh, remote controlled, they're at the stage and they can be controlled from the truck. We use Grace preamps. But when the Pro Tools platform that the guys and the engineers felt was stable enough, this opened up something that I'd been imagining for many years and been talking to other people around the Grammys to do, warming up production, the fact we're going to spend a little money doing this. Audio coordinator Mike Abbott was all over this and did a great job. We have two control rooms for music. We have our broadcast truck. I mentioned the FNL truck. FNL is out of business now. They sold to Sirius XM, who mothballed it. Those people from that company, many of them started a company called M3 Music Mix Mobile, and they do the music on most of the big award shows that you see. They really are uh, uh, top, top tier. And what they have is two exact same trucks. So they have a Pro Tools platform with a whole list of plugins, Genelec surround monitoring, I'll get to surround in a few minutes, Genelec surround monitoring, and next to it we have a second truck that's identical with the same menu of plugins, the same monitors, same size. So now what this did was change everything for us. We did something that really elevated the show, I would say this was probably six or seven years ago. Um, We could rehearse a band, we could rehearse ACDC, and 
when they were done, that mixer and the producer who maybe may have come up from that band or some representative of that band could move to the B truck and continue working for the next hour or two while the production is now putting Brandy Clark and Dwight Yoakam on stage. And then when Brandy Clark and Dwight Yoakam are done on stage, we move them where I just had ACDC, who've now been able to spend another hour and a half, get their balance without waiting for the director. They could rewind it as often as they want, get the balance, store it, and walk away. And the representative could tell the artists, it sounds great. I was just in the truck. We got a great balance. We're in a great place. We never be, were able to, they were never able to go tell the artist that before because no one knew. We were all, all kind of flying by the seat of our pants. Now we actually had a balance that people believed in. This is a, 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 an investment, a technique that very few TV shows do today. Maybe only one possible. I believe the, the Country Music Awards, the CMAs, have now copied this model, which is great because it gets them better audio. So what we're able to do was double our rehearsal time without affecting the work on the stage. Um, let, let me talk to you for a minute. Oh, well, let, let me continue. We'll go back to surround in a second. I'll give you another illustration of how we organize this to make it work. Okay, this is um, just an illustration of the rehearsal schedule. These are the bands from Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, the dress rehearsal Sunday, the show Sunday, in the order they rehearse in. And you'll notice in the right column that the two mixers I mentioned, John Harris and Eric Schilling, A, B, A, B, A, B. And that's the way we organize it, based on rehearsal. That's how we decide who's going to mix which song, based on rehearsal. Now has nothing to do with the show order. Show order is different. A guy might be in the chair and mix three numbers in a row, two numbers in a row, because the show order has nothing to do with the rehearsal order. But this is a reflection of what we need to do to make that two control rooms, two mirrored trucks, work to our best advantage. So that's how we kept that organized. Um, I have some crappy photos. I, I, when Ken was nice enough to invite me to come here. I was going to the Grammys next week, so I pulled out my iPhone at the last minute and took a few pictures. Um, this is the control room of uh, uh, M3. Very simple. Pro Tools uh, uh, D-Control, Genelec surround monitors. Nothing, nothing dramatic. Very, uh, very comfortable room to mix in. Um, Oops. Now, I mentioned our A1 in our production suite. That's Tom Holmes in the Denali truck. The Denali is the premier video truck for award shows, does the Oscars, does the Grammys, very high end. And just to his right in the next room is where the director is directing the show. So Tom is uh, uh, balancing the music that's sent from our music trucks that I, in the previous picture to Tom, and he's balanced that in the show with the ambience from the hall, with the mics around from the audience, with the presenters and the audio on the video playbacks and things like that. Let's see if there's anything else. ACDC, of course. By the way, when you saw them, unlike any show you see today where they put up a lot of guitar amps, most of them are dummies, they really only have a couple that are live. All these were live. And when we went to them and said, uh, you know, it's, and it was the loudest thing anyone had ever heard in Staples. The people inside were going crazy. It was so loud. And um, somebody went to them and said, you know, this is, this is TV. Maybe you don't need to use the whole setup. They said, this is our TV setup. <laughs> so, got to love them. That's ACDC. Um, This uh, horrible mess is really uh, the key to the, the whole thing working. This is Patch World, where Steve Anderson, who you can see uh, over his shoulder there, um, as we were looking at the band plots before, he has the incredibly mission-critical job of, as we're going from band A, uh, 
stage A to stage B to the passerelle to the dish, he is physically during the breaks unplugging these malts and plugging the stage A malts in so that they go where they need to go to front of house, two monitors and to us, unplugging them and plugging in the stage B or both when it's across A and B or the passerelle. And uh, I've worked with Steve for 25 years and uh, he's only made one mistake and he apologizes to me every year and there's no need because he's the best at his job, but he, he, he did mess up Celine Dion one time in the years past and he's never forgotten it, so. <laughs> When you work on this show, these, these guys are interesting. These are the top Hollywood guys. They work on all the top shows in every position. And uh, they all really take the Grammys more seriously than other things. They're audio guys. This is the Grammys. They take it really seriously, and they really give 110% every one of them and really want to do anything they can to make sure it comes off perfectly for these, for these artists. So we're very grateful for that. Um, this is, I'm uh, sitting with Tom Holmes right in front of, behind this door. The director is over there. All the engineering and shaders are in here. Transmission is in this truck. These are two uh, uh, married trucks, an A truck and a B truck that always work together. Um, let me go back and let's talk about surround for a minute. Um, any, how many of you find yourself when you're watching television ever listening in surround? Okay, a couple of people, good, good. I mean, there's some surround now. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of this. You're all pros, so many of you probably are, but there is no stereo anymore that's coming to your home. We don't publish any stereo from the Grammys. The LTRT that we listen to, we monitor with that, and I'll explain why in a minute, but it doesn't leave the site and go to New York. The only thing that's transported to your home, whether it's the Grammys from us in LA to Master Control in New York, from New York to their owned and operated stations, their affiliates, the cable head ends, direct TV, is 5-1. And when it gets to your house in your set-top box, it's 5-1. And not just the Grammys, I'm talking about whether you're watching CSI or The Good Wife, doesn't matter, it's 5-1. So you're only turning on your TV or you're in your kitchen, you flip on your TV, you're hearing stereo, but that's a down mix. And that down mix is, is constructed generally through Dolby parameters. There could be another codec that you have in a particular TV that you have turned on. That's happening right at your house. That's where stereo is, is derived. Um, it's the way of the world. It sucks. This is a system that, that some TV engineers a dozen or, or 15 years ago came up with as digital was taking over over the air broadcasting and they were coming up with scenarios of how they were going to transport this audio around and there were apparently as the way it's been explained to me there were 16 channels of audio available so they needed eight for the master and eight for their backup that was 5.1 plus two for the SAP channels for the for the uh, other language channels and there was no place for stereo so they were going to rely on the the down mix, the Dolby down mix. And um, we've been struggling with this ever since. In fact, you'll find yourself now that you, who, those of you who aren't aware of this, if you're turning on a football game on Sunday, you'll sometimes be sort of go, well, why is why is Al Michaels kind of buried or uh, they're just kind of the center is a little bit, um, it's as if people aren't monitoring it really carefully so they're not exactly sure what they're listening to. So let me, let me explain that a little further. We have to go through tremendous lengths and we do this at the Grammy show and we struggled with it for years and now we've kind of got it dialed in. As, as this system through digital, the broadcast uh, gets refined, um, we monitor in two channels for most of the show because people are listening at home in two channels most of the country. We are checking our surround. We care about our surround. We monitor the message boards during the show. I'm calling some Golden Ears guys in the, in the Eastern time zone and here in Chicago. Is everything okay? How's it sound? But 
we're sending out 5-1 and we're monitoring the LTRT based in our duplication of the downmix parameters that CBS uses to distribute this. We're modeling that in the trucks. So everyone on the site, from the director to all the audio engineers to everyone, is hearing the LTRT added two speakers, except us who are occasionally listening to stereo and making sure it's OK. But we're not publishing that LTRT. It never leaves our truck. And that's the same for all, all of the television that you get. It makes it a little bit dicey. Now, the audio leaves the Staples Center, and it's transported to CBS Master Control. They have a number of redundant paths. They used to rely exclusively on Dolby E. They still use Dolby E, but they have some uncompressed uh, paths now that get it to New York that they use as the primary, and I believe Dolby E is currently um, uh, the, the backup. But after master control where national commercials are inserted and other content may be inserted, it's then distributed, as I mentioned earlier, to the affiliates, to the cable head ends, etc. And that's all done in Dolby E, which is perfectly robust. We're perfectly happy with that. It gets to the local stations. They're inserting local commercials, so they are decoding it from Dolby E in their plants at CBS here in Chicago, at CBS wherever, or at the cable head end. And they are doing their local insertions, and then they're re-encoding it as Dolby Digital. And Dolby Digital, which is the consumer-facing format, Dolby E is, for those of you who are, who are not familiar with it, Dolby E is constructed so that it can be encoded and decoded many times. Uh, that's why it was built. So it's the purpose, uh, uh, that's the virtue of it. That attribute is very important if you're using it in this transport stream. But once it leaves the local and goes to your house, now it's Dolby Digital. Um, now it hits your set-top box, you turn on your TV, even if it's a 60-inch flat screen in your living room, uh, if you're listening to the TV speakers, you're listening to an LTRT that is derived from the 5.1 Dolby Digital that started as uncompressed, that we only monitor occasionally, went to New York, became Dolby E, went to the local, became Dolby Digital, went to your house, got down mixed, got to your ears. So there's a lot of links in this chain, a lot of ways for it to screw up. And this is why I think you'll see, if you now listen critically when you're listening to, to some live shows, you go, geez, the announcer's a little buried, or he's, it just, you know, the audience, the, the crowd at the ball game seems really loud. Well, that's because I don't think anyone's exactly listening as carefully or hasn't constructed a monitor environment that duplicates the downmix parameters as we do on our one show. And I think everyone tries, but I think there's a lot of room for mistakes in that scenario. Um, we've been struggling with this. It's the, it's the way of the world. It's the way broadcast is done now. There's nothing I can do about it. But we did have an interesting meeting with one of the uh, chief uh, engineers and he's a senior executive for all their audio infrastructure at CBS about a year and a half ago. We Two years ago at the Grammys, we uh, had a couple of our colleagues around the country in different markets. We collected three or four um, air checks. Now, some of you may remember that term. We, we used to collect air checks. I used to do this with Murray Allen, frankly. We'd collect v VHS tapes from around the country and see how it sounded in different places when we were in the, the world of analog broadcasting. Um, we got an air check out of the optical out of the set-top box in three or four markets and compared them. And they were incredibly different, which made us nuts. Um, I don't want to say that the mixes were so drastically different. They weren't. What was different was frequency response. And we told Bob Seidel, who, who uh, is our colleague at CBS, Frequency response, it's not the same between Tallahassee and Chicago and Florida and, and, and St. Louis. And we can show it to you. We gave him a song. We put it in four or five markets. We said, listen to this. Boom, 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 boom. Now, as I explained before, there's a lot of links in this chain. There are a lot of places this could all get funky. But I said, how do we address this? I mean, we care about this. We're the Grammys. We care about this. And he said, well, we do a test with every one of our stations every week. 
And I said, okay, well, tell me about the test. He goes, well, it's 30 seconds long. <laughs> I said, okay, I don't know if that's really going to do it. And he said, it's automated. It happens at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. And there's some pink noise blast that comes around and they test it. I said, okay, I need you to be thinking about what else we can do to try and see if there's any way to start reining this in. Because the bottom end is completely different between Miami and Chicago. And you told us that couldn't happen. <laughs> So we haven't solved it. That's our current uh, 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 mission, to tweak our friends at CBS with that and see if we can get push them a little further on that. But it's really, it's not their fault. It's the fact that we have inherited over the last dozen or 15 years a distribution system for broadcast audio that is hard to manage in my estimation, because our, our audiences are all listening in stereo, but we're not publishing in stereo. Um, let me show you, I brought an illustration of this. Okay. This is the 50th Grammys, so that's uh, seven years ago when we were just really getting into the beginning of um, surround production at the Grammys. Now, we don't do it like this anymore, but I want to show you how we did it at the beginning because surround was still, it was the Wild West out there to deliver. So we were the first ones on CBS to do uh, a, a true surround on a live show, on an award show, and have them deliver it. And we took a lot of pains to get it right. Now, I'm going to not use this laser pointer. I'm going to try and use my cursor. You can follow me. Right here in the center where it says um, surround five, the broadcast mix, that is where Tom Holmes from that photo I showed you, our main production mixer, sits. So that's the center of our mix world. The music trucks, which I also showed you, are up here. That's the music mix, which is flowing down toward Tom. We also take the front of house mixes as a safety. We always have the front of house mixes and bring them in uh, as a safety in case our trucks go down, our music mix trucks go down. And uh, we did have a year uh, where the, cap the last year of the Capricorn, which sealed its fate, we went through the first number and during the commercial after the first number, we tried to, re uh, tried to call up the, uh, the file for the second act and it crashed. And we couldn't get it up, we couldn't get it up, and we literally called to the A1, to Tom Holmes, and said, get your front of house mix ready. And as they were counting off that second number, one, two, three, four, we got it up, and we didn't use that, but that we needed it. So um, there's also playback elements. There's a spot box there. They're playing back when the presenters walk on. They play some music under them. When people win and they open envelopes, they're playing music. So all that is coming into this mix. Over here, this is an interesting thing. Back uh, eight years ago, we had a dedicated mix room just for the audience. I had you know 25 mics out in the Staples Center trying to come up with a sound, a surround soundscape that we thought we could use, that Tom Holmes could mix in, and we thought at that time, because it was very new for us, that we needed a separate surround mixer uh, for that. All right, and for that then, we're sending it, uh, the discrete five one channel mix to CBS in New York, and eventually it, this illustration says that it gets to uh, ProLogic 2, and there's my name down there, don't miss my name, under the great Phil Ramon. So that's how we did it back then. It's a little simpler now. Our tools are a little more dialed in. We use um, surround reverbs. We use surround processing all through uh, uh, our, our music mixes. We, we, at the beginning of the show, will set up three or four or five different reverbs that we we'll use during the show. They all have five one outputs. They're all surround plugins. Um, we handle our, our production mixer, Tom Holmes, will handle the audience mixing himself. He will get a balance of the room uh, and mix that in as needed, and I collaborate with him on that. Our philosophy, different from some, different from the Oscars, by the way, um, 
I like, we, we want this to feel live. We want the audience to feel at home, to feel they're in the Staples Center and there's a huge crowd and people are excited. But it's an industry crowd. They're not that excited. So uh, we do have a sweetener and he's added to this and, uh, and he's brilliant. So it's a combination of live sound and, and sweetening. But I like on the music performances to pull the hall back. I don't remove it, it's in there, but I pull it back. I prefer the impact and the punch and the transients where I can from the music mix to really carry the day. And uh, so we're, during the performances, I pull the hall back and then when the performance is open, you may, they're clapping and we're going for more hall and more excitement. If they're performing out on the dish in the middle, if you saw this show, that's where Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga performed and Juanis and, and uh, a number of the numbers were out there. Um, that's right in the middle of the hall, so we, it's about 20 rows off the stage, so we, we put a little more hall in that. I mentioned it's compared to the Oscars. Now the Oscars only do, it's a much simpler show for the audio department in that they do five or six numbers that they, they rehearse uh, and, and, and they sound great. Um, they went, the other night I was noticing a lot more reverb. They were just wetter. They didn't feel, but they're not rock and roll numbers. They're piano and singers and choir. They had an orchestra. They showed you up at Capitol Studios down a, a mile away that they were, uh, that was performing. Um, a little different sound than, than our show. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Beck. Um, some of you have read in the paper or you saw in the show that, that uh, an artist named Beck won Album of the Year. Uh, how many are familiar with his album? Oh, great. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, it also won Best Engineered, and it is a beautiful sounding record. If you are familiar with it, if you listen to it on Spotify, if you get it, it deserves Best Engineered. It's gorgeous. Um, and the producer, Ken Ehrlich, is really quite gifted at taking these performers and finding a way to add some additional spice to the number for television. Because although half this room have heard the Beck album, and you have all know who Beck is, um, the TV audience of 25 million, uh, they don't know anything about Beck. Um, so he wanted to add a little more spice to that, so he cast Chris Martin, the lead singer of Coldplay, to come in and just sing harmony with Beck, and it added something. But it was still a visually very flat number, and musically, a vibe piece. He had a band behind him. There were three acoustic guitars in the number. There's a rhythm section. The bass player's playing a stand-up bass on this number. It's very chill. It's just a vibe piece of music. It's fantastic if you're listening at home and, and uh, you like this music, but it doesn't jump out. It's not ACDC. Not only that, I, I've done a number of shows with Beck on our webcast. He's a very energetic performer. He's great. Not on this number. He was doing nothing. This number was this. Everybody's standing in a row, barely moving. Nobody even played a fill. It's really just a vibe piece. So in talking to the director, he was clearly flummoxed by this. He didn't have much to work with. I mean, this is the greatest, probably the greatest director working today, Lou Horvitz, who does many of the very top shows as a veteran, and he's great. He didn't have a lot to work with. But this is a number that I took some extra time and went a little bit out of TV norm because I was familiar with the record. Uh, as were our mixers, as was John Harris. I was familiar with it. I wanted to, ha to, to create something like the vibe of the record, and I wanted it to hopefully help carry the impact of what was unique about this performance, um, because visually there was nothing to signal that, and it was kind of a chill number that doesn't normally score at all on TV. Fortunately, he, was, he won album of the year, 15 minutes before he performed, so people were kind of up for this, and we had Chris Martin there to make it, give it a little different flavor. But um, 
we, we kind of approached this a little differently, and I'll play it for you in a minute. Uh, obviously, you either saw or you've read about the uh, extra press that Kanye West, another good Chicagoan, he's an old client of mine, he worked at Chicago Recording Company uh, back in the day before he was a recording artist. He was making beats and sending them off to J uh, Jay-Z. He worked in number studios in town, so we remember Kanye from those days. But he got involved in this back thing, and I... I only mention it because it takes me back to something I said at the beginning about what I like about the Grammys being a peer organization. And I, in this situation, I almost wanted to say to, to Kanye, who did you vote for? Did you vote? Because in the Grammys, you know, if you, if you don't play, you don't win. So for you folks who are, if you're involved in recordings, if you have some colleagues who are, you have some other people who are involved in this, be members, vote. And then you get to uh, uh, make your statement. So uh, enough people did, obviously, for Beck. All, uh, to be nominated in Album of the Year means you made a great album. But uh, enough people felt that Beck's was really a standout, that uh, he's the winner this year of Album of the Year. I'm going to show you, I'm going to play for you the number, which, as I say, we went a little bit outside the way we typically um, mix on the Grammy show because this record suggested it. All right, album of the year. Um, I want to ask. Uh, I want to answer any questions you have, but let me just uh, uh, wrap up my part of this with just if you're watching next year, and it's fucked up. It's my fault. <laughs> um, any thoughts? Any questions anybody has here, sir? Sure. Um, it's a great question. We're listening to the LTRT 90% of the time in the music trucks and uh, in, the, in the broadcast truck with Tom Holmes at least 90% as well, I would tell you. Um, we have a couple of strategies. First of all, we're relatively conservative with our surround mix soundscape. Um, we have some audience mics and the hall is spread to the back. We have some reverb in the back. We're not putting the saxophone player in the back like you might in a more adventurous Grammy winning, they have a surround category. There's some really adventurous mixes in there. We probably treat it a little bit more like uh, the surround soundscape of a classical record where the hall is really your three dimensionality. But your real question is, how do we monitor that? So all the control rooms, the three critical ones for broadcast, the two music trucks, and also then the uh, uh, final production mix truck, have surround monitoring. And we check them periodically. The, the guys in the music truck are checking it generally once a performance, just to make sure it's holding together as they checked it. They did it during rehearsal, that it's coming back together. Um, on a somewhat related point, uh, I, I neglected to mix the mention. I neglected to mention the other incredible thing we got from when we went to two trucks. Uh, I told you that it doubled our rehearsal time. What it really does, which is just as valuable, is during the three and a half hour live show, when ACDC is on the first stage, and they're setting up for the next artist, for Ariana Grande, they're, they're plugging mics and we're tapping mics. There's an A2 on that band deck tapping mics. We can monitor the line check in the B truck and make sure we're getting everything. And if we're not, you know, if we don't have the lead vocal, if a wireless mic's not there, we can, we can monitor that we're, we're talking to that crew all during the ACDC performance while we're working on the line check for the second performer. We never had that before. So that's actually increased the reliability and increased the speed and increased some things. That was not the question you answered. Did I answer your question about surround sound, though? Yeah, I guess so. Yes, I'm OK. It, we take our best guess. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, there's a lot of modern mixing going on. Everybody's got the in-ears and stuff. It seems like you've got to have as much. Somebody's got to do the modern mix for all that, and that takes as much effort as, as the live mix. So you've got the, the broadcast mix, the house mix, plus all these modern mixes. 
Yeah. Who's taking care of that? Um, the monitor mixers are fantastic. Uh, we, are, the Grammy folks, we don't monitor that. We fe uh, supervise that as closely because the artists are very clear. They, are, they make it very clear to the monitor mixers that they're either happy with their monitor mix or not. So when they're happy, they're good. Um, there are three or four mirrored desks in monitor world because again, similarly, there's so much going by so fast that they need to provide a number of monitor mixes and uh, that's a big job for them during rehearsal as well. Each one of these acts, it's not just the lead singers getting a mix, there could be eight mixes on that stage or more that they have to publish. Sir. Um, no, it's uh, the, the M3 truck is Matty. Um, the, um, the, there's fiber from the Grace preamps up to the um, to the uh, M3 Eclipse truck. Yeah. Um, it, it was funny. You're you're asking how we move it around the venue. Um, I think that's about all I know about that. I'm trying to think if there was any other. That's that. That's the best answer I have for you on that. Yeah. So is it is it analog to Patch World, and then from there it jumps into the Grace Prix and Maddie? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And um, there's there's one of the M3 technicians is standing by the Grace preamps and watching those. It's that exactly through that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the, the front of house mixer for many years, a gentleman named Ron Reeves, again, I consider him one of the best in the country, uh, 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 tremendous, and uh, we really have very little uh, issues. Now, he, has, he doesn't benefit from the rehearsal time that we have. Uh, Leslie Ann Jones, I mentioned, is out there uh, just working with him, but he does a great job, and he's, he's got to move along with the rehearsal schedule and the production uh, to get those mixes. And uh, there's tremendous sound pressure out there, and it's a great sound, and people have been very, very happy with it. Um, we're very fortunate for, for that, too, because, well, that's part of We feel we need to deliver that as well. Yeah. Mm. Um, you would think they would be, but generally the top front of house engineers who travel with these superstar artists, um, this is not a, they don't want to sit at this desk. There's too much scrutiny on this. There's too much pressure. It's not their job. It's not where they're expert. They collaborate with us and they can teach us the arrangements and tell us what the artists want and take rough mixes back and bring us notes and have their hands on the lead vocal fader on a particular fill or a particular cue if they're people we know. And most of them are very well uh, know after these years John Harris and Eric Schilling and many of them me from the road or from the Grammys and they trust us, but they collaborate uh, uh, with us. Uh, the only time in many years that I can think of that we had a guest mixer sit in was for Radiohead, who were so different and their producer engineer, Nigel Godrich, was there. I know Nigel. I trust him. He said he wanted to do it. I said, okay, if you can make something out of this, let's go. And it was great, you know, because we couldn't figure it out. It was too different. And he had come up with the number and, we're, 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 you know, collaborated with, with the group, and, uh, and uh, it, it was great. But that's extremely rare. Um, I know it was uh, something I was going to say to one of the earlier questions was about inputs. You're asking how audio is moved around. But... Um, number of inputs is, as someone mentioned, is kind of uh, interesting. One year, we had cold, not that long ago, we had Coldplay, and they were 60 inputs, and U2 were 64 inputs, and Radiohead was 70 inputs, and Paul McCartney was 16. Now, the punchline is, he sounded as big as any of them, his, uh, his mix sounded great. Jeff Emmerich, the great Jeff Emmerich, was there, 
collaborating with us on this number. And as he walked in, I said, Jeff, Coldplay's 60, and you two is 65, and you're only 16. And Jeff Emmerich said to me, and I only use 12. <laughs> it was great. Um, so we have some fun with that. I mean, the, the classic rock, obviously, it's a, it's a little bit different than some, some of the inputs we see now. And, and um, all, the, uh, you know, all the lead vocals you see are live, and, and almost so there are, are acts that, have, uh, that are, have track support, and we have you know, very uh, kind of uh, specific Pro Tools requirements, but we play back Pro Tools tracks. Sometimes you'll see Kanye perform this year, you didn't see another musician. That was a track playing, but he was, he was singing live, and we're, we're generally pretty good about that. We encourage all the bands to perform live when it's appropriate. Sometimes uh, I find that the bands from Nashville have a knee-jerk reaction that they want to play to track. They want to lip sync, uh, uh, not, not vocals, they want the band to play uh, along to track because they do a lot of TV and they can't trust many of the shows that they do. They don't have the confidence and we have to go back and say actually it's really not the best choice here you really want to do live it sounds more authentic it sounds more real it's the Grammys and we're going to give you great support and we had that situation this year and the artist did say okay cool then I'll play live and it worked out great it worked out great yes sir what ratio do you use for wired to wireless hmm mm -hmm. yeah um, a man named Dave Bellamy who's really one of the lead wireless people, and as long as we're talking about wireless and we're here in the Sure building, I know all of you are, are familiar with the fact that we're all fighting uh, for Spectrum to keep uh, wireless microphones working, and no one has literally underwritten it with their energy, their effort, and their money more than Sure. Sure, are really the leaders for that, so we thank Sure. I, I do all the time. Mark Bruner in this building has really led that effort in Washington, D.C. to try and preserve Spectrum for wireless, and we're standing on a tiny little island now to keep wireless working, and the water is rising, so uh, it, it's a tough fight, but uh, it's good. So your question about wireless is... Uh, um, it, it's a good one, and uh, we... Um, we depend on it, like every production does. And it's, it's the story that, that Sure tells when they're in Washington, and we tell all the time. You can't do the Grammy show without wireless microphones. You can't do Broadway without wireless. And as I had an opportunity, they bring some, some legislators, some Congress people through the Grammys every year, and I've had a chance more than once to tell one of them um, they can't get the play from the offensive coordinator into Tom Brady's helmet without wireless. <laughs> don't worry about music. You can't get the football game going if we don't have wireless. So um, there's a lot of wireless mics because uh, um, all the vocals typically, uh, some of the others out at the uh, 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 dish stage. So there are, with comms and everything, there's hundreds of channels of wireless in the building. But I have a crappy picture of, of wireless. Let's see if this comes up here. Travis, will that still all up? Oh, hang on a minute. This, uh, this is about a quarter of the wireless. There's a wireless technician back here. A quarter of the mics. There's tables of them with labels, with numbers. So for each number, they're rehearsed in advance. We rehearse with the same mic. It has to be the same mic that Justin Timberlake sings on. And in rehearsal, he's got to get, of course, back because the engineers need to know that it's the same mic. And it's given to, hit to an A2 who's managing that stage for that performance. And he's going to put it in the lead singer's hand or put it on the on on the stand, so it's a, it's a pretty uh, elaborate system that they're very very used to doing. Um, we have had one or two incidents. Justin Timberlake was on the show. I want to say two years ago, and right at, and he did a number with Jay Z, a big production number, kind of a duet number, and right as he was literally ready to walk out broadcast on my team called and said that mic is dead that battery is not something's going on there that mic is dead somebody get it fixed and they had like 30 seconds and Justin Timberlake 
justifiably is pretty pissed off. What do you, because the A2 took the mic away from him. There's something wrong with that mic. And he said, you know, I need the mic. What are you guys talking about? And they're all on calm and the PL trying to figure out what to do. And then somebody literally threw a battery across the backstage and all this. And then they did what we're prepared to do and we're always prepared to do. The A2 for that stage has a spare in his pocket. And he pulled it out and he gave it to Justin and said, here's your mic. And Justin said, that's not the mic I rehearsed on. And, and then the count off started and he had to go out with that mic. And that's the mic he sang on. Um, but that's the way we handle those kinds of emergencies. If there is a problem, mechanical problem, we have spares ready to go. And we've learned that over the years. We, you know, we used to have more screw ups and now that's our system for hopefully avoiding those screw ups. Yes, sir. No, no, I mean, it, there, there are occasional numbers where somebody is, it's primarily a dance number. The artist is an incredibly acrobatic dancer um, where they may have vocal support on there. Uh, for that reason, it's hard to expect them to do an A plus lead vocal while they're dancing acrobatically. Um, one of the, the most acrobatic numbers was not this year, a year ago the show opened with Beyonce doing a very provocative number, her hit Dan uh, Drunk in Love, and uh, she dances like crazy, but she sang. It was her voice. There was no backing track. That would be an example of one. I might have expected one, and there wasn't one. She sang that live. She's very, she's a great singer for that. Um, very rare. Occasionally, sometimes there'll be an effect. Um, Madonna this year had a pretty elaborate effect on her vocal that was another lead vocal. She sang throughout the whole number. You hear through the whole number, but there's uh, an affected, uh, uh, distressed vocal sound that is going along with her on the, on the track. But she sings. Now, pretty much everybody sings unless it's really a, a, a reason that's related to dancing. Yes, sir. Well, hmm. the, you, Kenny, the producer Kenny used to do more, he used to be crazier. He, he, used, to, he's, he used to have things that would go in from the balcony and to, to the stage and three and four different spaces. So I do remember some of those, the different, the most complex. Boy, you might have me on that. Uh, it's funny, the production is different every year. Um, they have different acts, they're going to organize them differently, they're going to set up different tributes. This year we had uh, Ed Sheehan went into ELO and they did, so they have to do things and they're talking about what's new and what's new. And I always whisper to our guys, for us, it's going to be the same. It's just, you know, different inputs. We're still going to have the same number, we're going to have the same amount of time to do it, we just have to balance different inputs. So, you know, we have I remember every blemish of every show. I remember the second show I was on and Billy Crystal walked out for, this is 25 years ago, walked out for his monologue and his mic was dead. And he's talking and no one's hearing him and then <laughs> reverberating through Radio City, it pops on and he goes, oh, it's a college date, huh? Um, which I thought was a funny line. Okay, not everybody did. Somebody else had a question. Ken. Uh, we absolutely do. Uh, Eric Schilling and I, who's one of the mixers, but he's on the executive committee of the Grammys, and he's he and I and uh, uh, Glenn Lord Becky, we we listen very very closely to the show afterwards. This is the first year that we made some of the performances. About two thirds of them are available for VOD. You can go to Vivo and see a bunch of the performances, not the two I showed you. Um, are there, but to your point, we, we listen very critically. I actually author a set of DVDs and Blu-rays, because DVDs are crap and Blu-rays are a little better. Um, uh, I author those for the TV committee, which is a group of about uh, 
uh, a dozen people that are really charged with uh, uh, working directly with the production company on the content of the show, and I've delivered those. And what will happen is they'll be a, they'll review those. There'll be a TV call in April where the TV committee will compare notes and literally lessons learned, things they liked about the show, things they didn't. The sound is just one item in, in 30 on that list. Uh, but the sound group, Eric Schilling and I, were very critical. I will tell you that this was the 57th Grammy, the 56th Grammy. When we left the theater, show was over, just ended. When we left, John Harris and Eric Schilling and I turned to each other and we, we were gritting our teeth. We said, this it just wasn't our best year. Just the mixes just didn't happen as well as solidly as we'd hoped. Some of them got away from us. Some of them were a little unwieldy. Sometimes the performers just, uh, it, we didn't feel as good about it. It won the Emmy, so don't tell anyone. We're very happy about that. Um, but it, we didn't feel it was our, our best show. This year, uh, we actually left there thinking that we got most of the mixes. We felt real good about this show. So it, it changes year to year. I mean, some years we'll come out with a note and go, you know, last year it just seemed like all the lead vocals were a dB shy. You know, uh, let's just listen. Let's just think about that. You know, a dB is not a lot, but it makes a difference. You know, for we're thinking about it, so we come out with those kind of notes. Travis. The loudness of the. Yeah. No, the Calm Act. Yeah. Sure. No. Don't do a thing. Um, I, I, we don't. Now, I'm, I'm not an expert in the Calm Act. I, I think it's, I'm under the impression it's more about television commercials and they have to be metered and meet certain specs when they are received at the stations and less about the programming. I could be completely wrong about that. But it's not a topic that, that we've ever addressed in production. I should ask about that. I know in commercial production it's very important now. And even though it's made a difference, commercials are louder than program anyway still. So, you know, annoyingly sometimes. During the Oscars it was very apparent. And it's just, you know, it's just the kind of compression that the down at Chicago Recording Company, our guys are experts at making the most of the Calm Act restrictions <laughs> to get the most sound pressure uh, on their commercials. Anybody else? Well, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. It was fun.